Happy 10th birthday this month to the Black by Black by by Black by Pay by by Pay and the title track all reached number one on the Billboard alternate. <coughs> Black by Black by Pay. Black by by Pay. Belch. It was their first album recorded since the death. <coughs> Phone call. Hello. Hey, how's it going? Greetings one and all, and welcome to Tom's Hit Parade. I hope you all are having a happy first week of summer so far. Yes, it is technically summer, but here I am in long sleeves because it is unseasonably cool and overcast out this morning up here for some reason. Don't know what's going on with the weather, but I also don't know what's going on with the year. Uh, it's almost the end of June already, and you know the year is halfway over, and it feels like I just did my 2018 albums countdown a few weeks ago. So I don't know what's going on, but uh, yes, I am... As is usually the case, uh, it's almost the end of the month and I still haven't gotten to my backtracks for the month of June, uh, but this is it here. Uh, yes, backtracks, my monthly roundup of notable album anniversaries, divisible by five, as well as at least one Spotlight album. So without further ado, let's just jump right in and see which albums are celebrating anniversaries for the month of June 2019. Celebrating its 60th anniversary this month is Art Blakey's Holiday for Skins. Originally released in two volumes, this set by the jazz drummer explores Afro-Cuban rhythms and features trumpeter Donald Byrd, pianist Ray Bryant, and bassist Wendell Marshall. Tracks include Lamento Africano, Mirage, and the Ray Bryant composition Reflection. Also released in June of 1959 was the Kingston Trio's At Large. It was their fourth album and their first studio album recorded in stereo. It sat at the top of the Billboard Albums chart for 15 weeks and earned a gold certification from the RIAA in 1961. Now, with the exception of their Best Of album, it is the group's best-selling release. It also scored them a Grammy win for the Best Ethnic or Traditional Folk Recording in the award category's first year. Tracks on the album include MTA and All My Sorrows. In June of 1964, Dusty Springfield released her U.S. debut album, Stay A While. It was released three months after her UK debut, A Girl Called Dusty, and consists of eight tracks from that album, including the Backrack David classic 24 Hours from Tulsa, as well as other singles, including the big hits I Only Want to Be With You, Wishin' and Hopin', and the title track. Also releasing their US debut album 55 years ago this month were Jerry and the Pacemakers with Don't Let the Sun Catch You Crying. Not unlike Dusty Springfield, this album was released several months after their UK debut, How Do You Like It, and culled half of its tracks from that release. Singles include the hit title track, the Rodgers and Hammerstein classic You'll Never Walk Alone, a cover of the Chuck Berry tune Maybelline, and the Gershwin standard Summertime. And as a very interesting trivia note, their single Don't Let the Sun Catch You Crying, which was their breakout hit in the US, was their fifth single, and the Beatles' fifth single, I Want to Hold Your Hand, also served as their first stateside hit. Half a century ago this month, Roberta Fleck released her debut album, First Take. It reached number one on the Billboard Top LPs and Soul Albums charts, and number three on the Billboard Jazz Albums chart. Among the tracks are two songs co-written by her future duet partner, Donny Hathaway, as well as the single, Compared to What, the Leonard Cohen penned Hey That's No Way to Say Goodbye, and The First Time Ever I Saw Your Face, which became a hit after being featured in the 1971 Clint Eastwood film Play Misty For Me, and earned Roberta Fleck Grammys for Song of the Year and Record of the Year. Also released in June of 1969 was Suitable for Framing, the sophomore album by Three Dog Night. It peaked at number 16 on the Billboard 200 and number 15 on the Canadian Albums chart, and earned them a gold certification in the U.S. by the end of the year. Two tracks on the album feature the horn section from the band Chicago. Among the track listing is Lady Samantha, a song written by Elton John and Bernie Taupin, who had yet to become widely known in the U.S., as well as a cover of the Sam Cooke hit A Change Is Gonna Come. Singles from the album include the Billboard Top 10 hits Easy To Be Hard and Eli's Coming, and the Top 20 hits Celebrate, all three of which peaked in the Top 10 on the Canadian singles chart. Happy 45th anniversary this month to America's fourth album, Holiday. Produced by George Martin, it was the first studio album with Willie Leacox on drums. The album peaked at number three on the Billboard Albums chart and was certified gold by the RIAA. The singles Tin Man and Lonely People both reached the top five of the Billboard singles chart and number one on the adult contemporary charts. And as a trivia note, this was the third of six consecutive America albums whose titles start with the letter H. 
also released in June of 1974, was Minnie Ripperton's sophomore album Perfect Angel. Produced by Stevie Wonder under a pseudonym, it was released four years after her debut. It topped the Billboard R&B Albums chart and hit number four on the Billboard Pop Albums chart. And it was her only album to go gold, and that was based on the strength of the top five hit Love and You, which was written and recorded at the end of the sessions at the behest of Wonder, and based on a lullaby that Ripperton would sing to her daughter. Other singles include Reasons, Every Time He Comes Around, which featured backing vocals by Denise Williams, and Seeing You This Way, which featured a guitar by Michael Cimbello. And coincidentally, here's another fascinating trivia note, Stevie Wonder, Denise Williams, and Michael Cimbello would all appear on the pop singles charts within a year of each other, a decade after this album was released. June of 1979 saw the release of I Am, the ninth album by Earth, Wind, and Fire. It peaked at number three on the Billboard 200 and number one on the Billboard Soul Albums chart. It earned platinum certifications in the UK and Canada and went double platinum in the US. Lead-off single Boogie Wonderland reached number six on the Billboard Hot 100 and number two on the Hot Soul Songs chart and was nominated for Grammys for Best Disco Recording and Best R&B Instrumental Performance. The subsequent single, After the Love Has Gone, peaked at number two on both charts won a Grammy for Best R&B Vocal Performance by a Duo or a Group, and was nominated for a Grammy for Record of the Year. Another Grammy nominee was band frontman and album producer Maurice White, in the category of Producer of the Year, Non-Classical. Also released 40 years ago this month was The Knack's debut album, Get the Knack. It was produced by Mike Chapman, who had produced Blondie's Parallel Lines the year before. Not only was it one of the most successful debut albums up to that point, having sold one million copies in just two months and topping the Billboard 200 chart for five weeks, but it was also a very quickly and inexpensively recorded album. It only took two weeks to record at a cost of just $18,000. The first single, My Sharona, held the number one spot on the Billboard Hot 100 for six weeks. It also reached number one in Canada and Australia. And it was Capitol Records' fastest selling debut single since the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand. The follow-up single, Good Girls Don't, peaked at number 11 on the Billboard Hot 100. 35 years ago this month, Bruce Springsteen's seventh album was Born in the USA. It reached number one on the album charts in 11 countries, including the UK, Australia, Canada, Sweden, and the USA, where it sat in the top spot for seven weeks out of 143 weeks on the chart. In 10 years, the album would be certified 15 times platinum in the USA, and as of 2012, it sold an estimated 30 million copies worldwide. All seven singles from the album reached the top 20 in the UK and also hit the top 10 on the Billboard Hot 100, including Dancing in the Dark hit number two, Glory Days number five, and I'm on Fire number six. The album was nominated for a Grammy for Album of the Year. And as a trivia note, subsequent pressings of the compact disc release were the first to be manufactured in the USA when Sony opened its plant in Terre Haute, Indiana in 1985. Also released in June of 1984 was Purple Rain, Prince's sixth album and the soundtrack to the movie of the same name. It held the number one spot on the Billboard 200 for 24 weeks, spending a total of 126 weeks on the chart. Currently, it stands as the sixth best-selling soundtrack of all time, and is certified 13 times platinum by the RIAA. It scored a nomination for the Album of the Year Grammy. Four of the album's five singles were top ten hits in the U.S., including When Doves Cry and Let's Go Crazy, which hit number one. The title track peaked at number two, and I Would Die For You reached number eight. Thirty years ago this month, the B-52s released their fifth album, Cosmic Thing. It was their first album recorded since the death of original guitarist Ricky Wilson in 1985. It peaked at number four in the U.S., where it's certified four times platinum, number one in Australia, and number eight on the U.K. charts. Six of the album's tracks were produced by Niall Rogers, including Rome and Deadbeat Club, and Don Was produced the other four tracks, including the singles Love Shack and Channel Z. Love Shack hit number one in Australia, Ireland, and New Zealand, and Rome was a top ten hit in New Zealand, Ireland, and Canada. Both singles peaked at number three on the Billboard Hot 100. Also released in June of 1989 was Eagles member Don Henley's third solo album, The End of the Innocence. It was the last album he'd record for 11 years. It was his most successful album, selling over 6 million copies in the U.S. and peaking at number 8 on the Billboard 200 and also in Canada. It was nominated for a Grammy for Album of the Year. The title track, co-written by Bruce Hornsby, was a top 10 single and received a Grammy for Male Rock Vocal Performance and nominations for Record of the Year and Song of the Year. Other singles include The Heart of the Matter and The Last Worthless Evening, both of which peaked at number 21 on the charts. 
And as a trivia note, Edie Brickell, Melissa Etheridge, Cheryl Crow, Ivan Neville, and Axl Rose all contributed backing vocals on the album. A quarter of a century ago, Stone Temple Pilots released their sophomore album, Purple. It was produced by Brendan O'Brien and spent its first three weeks on the Billboard 200 in the number one spot. It also topped the album chart in Australia and was a top ten album in Canada, New Zealand, and the UK, as well as Sweden. It currently enjoys a six times platinum certification in the US and is on several rock album best of lists. Singles Vaseline and Interstate Love Song topped the Billboard Mainstream Rock Tracks chart and Big Empty reached number three. June of 1994 also saw the release of Alan Jackson's fifth album, Who I Am. It peaked at number five on the Billboard 200 and number one on the Billboard Country Albums chart, and four and a half years after release was certified four times platinum. Four of the album's singles hit number one on the Billboard Country Singles chart, including Summertime Blues, a cover of the Eddie Cochran classic, and Livin' on Love, both of which hit number one on the Canadian Country Singles charts, as well as the third single, Gone Country. Happy 20th anniversary this month to Supernatural, Santana's 18th album. It was a blockbuster success, sitting in the top spot of the Billboard 200 for 12 non-consecutive weeks, eventually going 15 times platinum. It hit number one in 10 other countries and was the band's first number one album since Santana 3, 28 years earlier in 1971. It boasts guest appearances by Eric Clapton, Lauren Hill, and Dave Matthews, amongst others, and won eight Grammy Awards, including Album of the Year and Best Rock Album. The smash hit single Smooth, featuring Rob Thomas of Matchbox 20, spent 12 weeks at the number one spot on the Billboard Hot 100 starting in October of 1999, making it the last number one single of the 90s and the first number one single of the 2000s. It also hit number one in Canada and the top five in the UK, Australia, and Ireland. And that song won three Grammys, including Song of the Year, Record of the Year, and Pop Collaboration with Vocals. Also released in June of 1999 was the Red Hot Chili Peppers' seventh album, Californication. It was their third consecutive studio album produced by Rick Rubin, and was their most successful album outside of the U.S., topping the charts in seven countries, including France, Italy, Norway, and Australia. It went top ten in 13 other countries, including number two in Canada and Germany, number three in the U.S., and number five in the U.K. Singles Scar Tissue, Other Side, and the title track all reached number one on the Billboard Alternative Songs chart and the top ten of the New Zealand Singles chart. Scar Tissue won in the Best Rock Song category at the 2000 Grammy Awards. Fifteen years ago, The Killers released their debut album, Hot Fuss. It peaked at number one on the UK and Australian albums charts, number four on the Canadian chart, and number seven on the Billboard 200. It received a Grammy nomination for Best Rock Album. Singles include Mr. Brightside, Somebody Told Me, All These Things That I've Done, and Smile Like You Mean It, all of which reached the top 20 on the UK chart and the US Alternative Rock Songs chart. Somebody Told Me was nominated for the 2004 Grammy for Best Rock Performance by a Duo or Group with Vocal, and All These Things That I've Done got a nomination for the same award in 2005. June of 2004 also saw the release of Contraband, the debut album by supergroup Velvet Revolver, whose members include Stone Temple Pilots frontman Scott Weiland and three members of Guns N' Roses. The album peaked at number one on the Billboard 200 and spent 51 weeks on the chart. It earned a double platinum certification in the U.S. Single Slither topped the Billboard Mainstream Rock Tracks chart for eight weeks and earned the band a Grammy Award for Best Hard Rock Performance. Follow-up single Fall to Pieces also reached number one on the Billboard Mainstream Rock Tracks chart for 11 weeks. Happy 10th birthday this month to the Black Eyed Peas' fifth album, The End, or The END. It spent two weeks at number one on the Billboard 200 and 38 weeks in the top 10, out of a total of 114 weeks on the chart. It also reached number one in seven other countries, including Australia and Canada, and top 10 in 15 other countries. It was particularly successful in France, where it spent 11 non-consecutive weeks at number one out of 55 weeks in the top 10. The album scored nominations for six Grammys, including Album of the Year, and a win for Best Pop Vocal Album. The album spawned three number one singles, including Boom Boom Pow and I Got a Feeling, which topped the chart back to back, resulting in the group spending a record 26 consecutive weeks at the top of the Billboard Hot 100. Also released in June of 2009 was In Living Cover, the sophomore album by singer-songwriter Jay Brannon. It reached number 10 on the Billboard Heat Seekers chart and consists of two original songs and seven covers, including songs originally by Joni Mitchell, Bob Dylan, and the Cranberries. Now, this obviously is not a huge album, but it is one of my favorites. Uh, Jay Brandon is a particularly good artist. Uh, he's, his lyrics are kind of dark, 
but they're kind of they're sort of you know juxtaposed against this beautiful angelic voice. I mean, you've got to listen to Jay Brandon's voice. He's just he's great. I mean, he's definitely not mainstream. He is an indie artist. In fact, some of his songs take uh, rather pointed jabs at mainstream pop music. Uh, you know, take that as you will. I kind of have mixed feelings about that. But anyway, this is a good album. I mean, all his albums are great. This is a good one. It's got uh, Zombie by the Cranberries, as I mentioned, and uh, I can't remember what song is by uh, originally by uh, uh, Bob Dylan. Oh, Blowing in the Wind is on here. And uh, But yeah, it's a good album. All of his albums are great. As I said, check them all out. He's got, I believe, just three albums, possibly more. But uh, yeah, he is not to be missed. If you like good singer-songwriter stuff that's kind of outside the mainstream, check out Jay Brandon. In June of 2014, Lana Del Rey released her third album, Ultraviolence. It debuted at number one on the album charts in 12 countries, including the US and the UK. And it peaked at number two in France, number three in Brazil, and number four in China. It made the year-end lists of numerous publications, including Rolling Stone, Entertainment Weekly, Spin, and NME. Singles include West Coast, Shades of Cool, Brooklyn Baby, and the title track. Also released five years ago this month was Ed Sheeran's sophomore album, Multiply. It reached number one in the US, the UK, Canada, and 12 other countries, and it went top 10 in 11 more. It received a Grammy nomination for Album of the Year and won the Brit Award for British Album of the Year. It broke a record set by Adele's 21 as the longest charting top 10 album in the UK. It was also the most streamed album in the world for 2014. Its most successful single, Thinking Out Loud, topped the singles charts in 12 countries, including the UK, and peaked at number two in the US and Canada, and won Grammys for Song of the Year and Pop Solo Performance, and was nominated for Record of the Year. Other singles include the UK number one, Sing, and the top 10, Don't, as well as the top 20, Photograph. Okay, and we have arrived at the time for the Spotlight albums, and okay, I went a little bit overboard this month, and I actually somehow ended up with three albums that are celebrating anniversaries in July. Uh, don't expect this to ever happen again, uh, but then again, the fact that I only spent uh, the most expensive album in this lot was $3.95, so I spent, you know, about $10 uh, on all three of these albums. Uh, I'm going to go through the first two of them kind of quickly because there's not a whole lot to say about them. They're, I mean, they're okay, but uh, yeah. Uh, okay, first of all, uh, Back to the Egg by Wings, Paul McCartney's band. Uh, this is celebrating its uh, 40th anniversary, anniversary this month, 1979. It was Wings' seventh and final album. And this is actually my first exposure to Wings beyond I Have a McCartney's uh, Greatest Hits, Two Disc Greatest Hits collection. It has some of his solo stuff and some of his Wings hits. So that was the only exposure. And yes, I was fully aware that this is not the best album to introduce yourself to uh, the Wings stuff with. This got very, very mixed reviews, uh, kind of bad reviews. And I... I can kind of see why it wasn't a horrible album. It was just the reviews said it was kind of all over the place, and I sort of get that. There were a couple of good songs on here. I honestly cannot remember what they were. I think Getting Closer was a good album. I also like the ones with the the, the orchestra, the or orchestral backing on them. Uh, gosh, I, I honestly, I'll have to listen to this album a couple more. I listened to it two or three times, and just you know, none of the songs really stuck with me. There's something... I'm not a huge, huge Beatles fan. I mean, I, I like the Beatles. I, I won't ever pass up an opportunity to listen to the Beatles. It's just I'm not an avid fan of theirs. But so, of course, there's something very comforting about Paul McCartney's voice. And, you know, growing up in the 80s, I, I liked several of uh, McCartney's 80s hits. Uh, so, yeah, there's, as I said, something very comforting about hearing McCartney's voice in songs. So, you know, that right there was a drawing... Uh, a draw for me on this one. So, yeah, an okay album. I'm probably going to try dipping into the wings a little bit more uh, because I was, as I said, fully aware that that was not the album to start with uh, the wings. Second album is by Carly Simon. It's called Spy, and this uh, also celebrates its 40th anniversary this month, uh, released in June of 1979. It was her eighth album, and I think this was her last album on the Electra label, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the, there was a single called Vengeance on this album, which features Tim Curry on backing vocals, which was kind of interesting, and that actually received a Grammy nomination for Female Rock Vocal Performance, and that was the first year that that award was presented at the Grammys. So there's a trivia note for you. But yeah, this was, again, this was a good album. I, I, I like Carly Simon. My sister was a big fan of Carly Simon, and I've gotten a few of her albums, uh, but mostly these are her later albums in which she's done mostly covers of standards and 
popular songs and stuff. I don't have a lot of exposure to her original material. But yeah, this was good. And again, kind of like with uh, Paul McCartney, in a way, uh, I, there's some sort of a comfortable, you know, putting on an old sweater sort of feeling with Carly Simon's voice. I can't really describe it. But uh, yeah, this is a good album. Uh, I, I would encourage people to check out Carly Simon if they like female singer-songwriter types. Uh, folk-ish, you know, pop folk kind of, she str straddles the line really between pop and folk. She's not really folk, but uh, yeah. Check out Carly Simon. I, uh, trying to think if there are any really, really good songs that really struck me. Uh, Vengeance was a good song. That was the opening track. And uh, Just Like You Do, that was another good one off of uh, Side A. Uh, Love You By Heart, that was a, a good a good ballad on there. Pure Sin was another good one. So, yeah, uh, some, some good songs on here. It's not a particularly standout album, I don't think. Uh, but, yeah, as I said, if you, if you like Carly Simon, check out that album. Yeah, I kind of went through those two fairly quickly, didn't I? Uh, you know, not a whole lot to say about them, uh, even though I've, I've listened to both of them uh, a few times, as I said. And this next one, uh, this is definitely the standout of the trio here. The debut album by rock supergroup Bad Company. Uh, it was It's fantastic. If you love good old 70s muscly rock type of stuff, check these guys out. It's, it's, it's fantastic. It's a lot better than I expected it would be. Uh, I always hesitate when I when I look into 70s rock and this is this was kind of classified as hard rock although I would hesitate to classify it as hard rock really um you know I, I hesitated to check out um Led Zeppelin last year when I checked out their album and I absolutely loved it it was one of my favorites of last year and uh, yeah I've got to say that this is probably going to be end up being one of my favorite backtracks albums of this year excellent uh the first side is kind of rockish uh, can't get enough was of course their big single it was really really good uh, Rock Steady was another great one. Uh, Don't let me down, and the uh, side B was kind of on the more subdued side, sort of the more power ballad kind of stuff. Uh, with the exception of Moving On, that was kind of a propulsive locomotive kind of a beat sort of thing to it. What, another one of the standouts was the closing track Seagull. That was very much a a, a power ballad sort of thing. Uh, very very good ballad song. I mean, th this is just when you want textbook 70s rock check out Bad Company. I, I overlooked this band for way too long, in my opinion. I think I'm going to check out these guys a little bit more. Uh, this album, incidentally, uh, for the trivia stuff, it reached number three on the UK charts, where it spent 25 weeks, hit number seven in Canada and number one in the US, and uh, it's it's gotten us uh, five times platinum certification uh, in the ensuing years. And it's also included in the book, 1001 Albums You Must Hear Before You Die, uh, which I could not disagree with. Uh, so yeah, definitely check this album out if you haven't yet. Uh, give Bad Company a try. I, As I said, I just overlooked them for far too long. So a fantastic album. Debut album by Bad Company. So anyway, yeah, I guess that is it for Backtracks for June of 2019. And that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and I appreciate feedback, whether about this video or anything on my channel, or about music in general. I'd love to hear from you in the comments section below. I invite you to subscribe to my channel as well and check out my past videos to see what you might have missed. I'm also on Twitter, and you can find a link to my Twitter feed in the description below, so check it out and follow along. Also, please take the time to visit my friends and fellow YouTubers' channels, which are also linked to in my description below. They're all great at what they do, and they're very much worth your attention. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time, and remember, life's too short to be a music snob.